In fact, an America never was uh, the world's policeman. And the reason for that has something to do with what a policeman is. A policeman, a legitimate policeman, as we understand it, uh, is appointed according to the law by duly constituted authority, operates according to the law, and is accepted in principle, if not always in practice, by the majority of the population concerned. None of that is true of the United States. Uh, the United States has been appointed by no community as the world's policeman, operates according to no universally acknowledged law, uh, and has not even followed in, you know, in detailed cases what law does in fact exist. In the vast majority of countries around the world, the large majority of the population rejects this role on the part of the United States. And that is even true uh, in key American allies. The notion that the US has the right and duty uh, to act as policemen and intervene around the world is based very much on the notion that the world as a whole is lawless and without America would be continually on the brink or indeed over the brink of tumbling over into war and anarchy. Now there are parts of the world like that, uh, but the majority of the world is not like that in fact. If you take Africa, of course, under all the rhetoric, the United States and action, of course, to Europe as well, have done their utmost not to get involved in most African conflicts. And this is not because, in most cases, the rest of the world or the other members of the, of the UN Security Council would have prevented us. We didn't not go to Rwanda. Uh, because China or Russia was trying to stop us. We didn't not go to West Africa because they were trying to stop us. Um, and the hesitations about getting more involved in the Congo are not because they're trying to stop us. It's because, frankly, we don't want to. It's not important enough to us. Well, you know, once again, the policeman who decides that he's not going to investigate uh, or deal with a set of really awful crimes because they're not important enough to him is not a policeman. We've seen again and again, most recently in the Caucasus, that the US is not, in fact, all-powerful everywhere, that it can't bring its power to bear uh, on many specific cases. And that relates not just to the nature of American power, but it also relates to the American population. If you go out to small-town America, to the heartland, of course they are extremely nationalist very often. They will hit back, they wish to hit back and hard if America is attacked. But they have no interest in America playing the, the role of the world policeman, at least if that involves <coughs> them paying either higher taxes or, God forbid, actually having to serve and die. You cannot, in fact, mobilize the American population behind a program of world domination, whether or not dressed up in the language of being a policeman. If Obama is elected, uh, he's not going to break with this American tradition of, of presenting itself at, with a mission uh, to lead the world towards peace and freedom. That's far too deeply rooted in American culture. If you read what the Democrats have been saying about this, forging new alliances, etc., etc., what they really mean is mobilizing Europe behind what they want to do. But I do hope that uh, Obama um, will adopt uh, a much more pragmatic uh, policy uh, towards the use of American power in the world, and more, one more focused not on the creation of grand world coalitions behind great causes, but behind the resolution or management of particular issues in particular places. In October 2001, in the early days of the Afghan war, some American soldiers on board the USS Enterprise were preparing a missile that would later be fired at Afghanistan. They decided to write a message on the missile, and they wrote the following. They wrote, hijack this, you fags. Now, uh, obviously, that's an example of army wit, but their bosses, their bosses in the military did not find it funny. Uh, the US Navy expressed official disapproval of the message. There followed uh, a whole raft of new unofficial guidelines about what could and could not be written on post-9-11 missiles. First of all, this incident shows how far the culture of political correctness has spread its tentacles when, you know, even when someone is launching a bomb that will kill people, the overriding concern is whether it will offend them as well. <laughs> so uh, I think there is also something uh, more tellingly profound about that incident. Uh, I, I think it captures perfectly that while America is still immensely powerful in military terms, it simply doesn't know what it stands for anymore. 
You know, America has got more missiles than any other nation on Earth, but it literally doesn't know what to write on those missiles. I think America's ability to act as the policeman of the world, to, to kind of manage relations between states, has significantly diminished over the past 15 or 20 years. And that has been a result of both objective and subjective factors. The objective fact America faces today is that over the past 15 years, the world has become a far more fragmented place. Uh, during the Cold War era, that relatively stable time in global affairs, America's leadership of the Western fold was pretty much uncontested. Since the end of the Cold War, that has all changed. In a world with no clear dividing line between West and East, and, and where the policy and propaganda of anti-communism no longer works, America has a far greater difficulty offering a lead to Western nations, much less across the globe. On this front, it's really instructive to contrast the first Gulf War of 1991 with the second Gulf War of 2003. In the first Gulf War, America was able to lead a formidable coalition of powerful states in its assault on Iraq. Uh, including Britain, France, Italy, Canada, Germany. You know, the UN authorized the attack, and America led virtually the entire Western world uh, in order to bomb Iraq back to the Stone Age, as one US official tactfully put it. The last burst of its policeman role, if you like. Just consider the second Gulf War, 12 years later. The UN, a body created by the US in the 1940s, largely to, to cement its post-war leadership, the UN did not authorize the 2003 war in Iraq. The war was opposed by France and Germany, which was significant. Uh, the coalition against Iraq this time still includes Britain, of course, but also an array of weak states that are easily cajoled by Washington, uh, Albania, the Solomon Islands, Micronesia. Uh, and, and what happened in between those two wars, in between the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War, is that American leadership of the West withered. Uh, you know, without the, the raison d'etre of standing up to communism, America's global role that it assumed for itself stood exposed as shallow and visionless. We should remember that that 40-year Cold War period of relative unity between Western states under one nation's leadership was a very unusual and short-lived era in history. You know, prior to the Cold War, relations between capitalist powers were defined by rivalry, tension, one-upmanship, competitiveness... And when the Cold War institutions, those mechanical devices for suppressing Western tensions, when those institutions fell apart, rivalry came to the surface once more. So the fragmentation of the West after Gulf War I, after that final flourish of Cold War unity, is actually something like a return to normality in world affairs. But, and it's a normality that does not suit uh, America. However, I would argue that subjective factors have been, if anything, even more decisive in the decline of America's policeman role. America's lack of direction in the international sphere is also triggered by its severe crisis of legitimacy in the domestic sphere. It is the American elite's own uh, political and moral malaise which means it is unable to take a lead in international affairs. You know, we sometimes forget wars are frequently lost at home rather than on the battlefield itself. You know, how a nation like America conducts itself uh, in world affairs is about far more than the personalities in the White House. It's about far more than whether it's Bush or Obama. It's very much influenced by political coherence and legitimacy in the heart of the political capital. You know, for example, people still talk about America's Vietnam syndrome as if it were merely a foreign policy issue, as if it was simply humiliation at being defeated by a third world army. In reality, the real import of uh, the Vietnam syndrome for the US elite over the past 40 years, is that Vietnam unveiled a profound political malaise in Washington. You know, it was through the Vietnam experience that the American elite lost its young middle classes, lost control of black inner city areas, lost the argument with significant sections of its population about duty, honor, sacrifice, other, and other American values. That crisis of values still informs Washington's foreign policy today. And it gives rise to uncertain, unpredictable interventions in world affairs. 